All right, everyone. So we'll get started. Uh, a few folks are still trickling in, but we're just trying to do an introduction stuff in the beginning. Anyways, uh, welcome and thank you all for joining us for a very exciting webinar today, Honoring Living Landscapes with Stories. My name is Shane Hanlon, more about me in a second. Uh, but before we really even get going, um, I wanted to ask all of you a question. And so kind of general, but just how likely are you to use literary works in your communication and education, science communication, teaching, everyday communication, frankly, uh, just kind of to get a sense of what folks are doing or what people are intending to do. So I'll leave this up for say a minute or so and just gauge where folks are at. In the meantime, just some housekeeping stuff. Uh, we'll have a formal Q&A at the end. Uh, there is a Q&A box on your Zoom platform. So you can ask questions throughout. I will be monitoring them for our guests and then we'll get to uh, what we can at the end of the webinar today. All right, I'll give folks a few more seconds to answer. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, kind of pretty even across the board. Um, a little bit with that, with that for confidence. So that's that's really great that a lot of you are already doing this or already comfortable doing this. Hopefully after uh, today, you'll be even more comfortable with it. So just some housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with uh, AGU, the American Geophysical Union, that's my place of employment. Uh, we are a big earth and space science society. Uh, we have a bunch of scientific journals, a usually a handful of small topical conferences and then one big fat one every year. Uh, last year was completely virtual, this year virtual hybrid, uh, but that's kind of our really our bread and butter. Within AGU is the Sharing Science Program, and that's what I'm in. I'm the program manager for this program. And our whole goal is to help scientists communicate more effectively. So we provide scientists with the skills, tools, opportunities, resources, whatever they might need to communicate more effectively. And we do this through a number of ways. This is kind of one of the big ones. We have a big webinar series every year. We do a lot of workshops, but we also have a lot of informal resources as well. So I'm not gonna belabor this. We will be following up with all of you with a bunch of resources afterwards. Uh, if you're interested in us in sharing science uh, more broadly. Like I said, this is part of a storytelling webinar series that we've been doing. So we have all of these ones we've done so far archived, and then we have a few more, or a couple more after this as well. So we'll provide information on those uh, in that follow up as well. Like I said, my name is Shane Hanlon. I'm an AGU employee. Uh, I am a science communication trainer, let's say. Uh, and uh, I'm really here to facilitate today. Usually it's myself and my colleague, Olivia. She is out right now. But really, I'm here on the back end to answer any general science communication things and really just to uh, monitor the chat, the Q&A, and provide a space for our guest speakers today, who we're very excited to have. And I will let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Shane. Patslahane, everyone. I said good day. In a monitua, sapoka sweetis, kasliapotem Sierra Green. I introduced myself in my native language, Ninipu Timt, or Nest First, as you may commonly know us as. I'm faculty at Northwest Indian College in the Native Environmental Science Program at the Nest First site and campus. And I'm honored to be here today with Steve, and I'll pass it over to him to introduce himself. Thank you, Sierra. Hello, my name is Steve Semkin. I'm a professor of geology and education at Arizona State University. Uh, I've been here 18 years, but before that, I spent the first 15 years of my career teaching at Diné College, the tribal, like Northwest Indian College, a tribal college, the tribal college of the Navajo Nation. And that experience has really forever influenced my, my research and teaching on place-based and culturally informed education. Uh, I like to say when it's very important that I am not indigenous to this continent and I do not speak on behalf of any indigenous culture. However, as I also like to say, I'm the only member of my immediate family who is not indigenous, including children and grandchildren. 
children. So I do have a very deep personal interest in the well-being of Indigenous people and a sincere respect for Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous cultures. And uh, again, I too am very honored to be here with you today. And with that, I, we're very excited to have both of you. Uh, Steve, I will let you kick us off. Okay, thank you, Shane. So yes, my, my talk is going to be about understanding living landscapes through place-based literature. And this is a, a project that was undertaken recently um, through my own academic unit, the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State. And also I want to acknowledge um, the a ASU Desert Humanities Initiative at ASU, which funded this work. Um, and here is a sort of an illustration of a, of a, of a very uh, illustrative living landscape. This is a place on the Navajo Nation on the Colorado Plateau, which is referred to by its indigenous name, Tseye, which means rock within it, describing the canyons, um, also known as Canyon de Shea National Monument. And uh, I think from this illustration, you can see that this is indeed a living landscape. It's, uh, it's substantially uh, dominated by towering walls of, of uh, sandstone, but it's also, you know, it's a riparian zone with, with trees and plants. And you can also see it's an agricultural area. Dinette people have been living and raising livestock and, and raising crops in this valley for, for, uh, for many, many, many centuries. And, and so this is truly a living landscape in every sense of the word. Uh, next slide, please. So my interest is in, in place-based education and place-based education is, is situated in place. And one way to think of a place is it's a, it's a location that human beings give meaning to. So there's a, there's a natural component to be sure. There's a geological, hydrological, ecological, climatic component to any place, but, but also it becomes a place when, when human beings give it a name and when human beings experience it in some way, they live in it, they tell stories about it, they, um, they earn a living there, um, they study it maybe as scientists and so on. And uh, my main interest being where I'm located is in Southwestern North America, which includes also Northwestern parts of Mexico. So sort of Southwestern corner of the continent. I'll refer to it as the Southwest sort of uh, for short. Um, it's a region that like any other regions on, on the planet, interweaves living natural and cultural landscapes. Natural landscapes made up of natural features like landforms and cultural landscapes made up of places. Um, in these landscapes, the features and human narratives together encode ancient and current scientific literacies, di culturally diverse literacies about geological, climatic, and human change over eons. In other words, the people who inhabit these places, they observe and they think about and they interpret natural processes according to their own cultural perspective. So if we're gonna teach about the Southwest in a place-based way, we want to engage meaningfully with all of the meanings of the place and that includes human narratives as essential context. We're not just talking about how we interrogate, if we will, the, the solid earth or the, the fluid earth with our scientific methods, but also with how human beings have documented and how human beings have interpreted these places throughout, throughout human history, including you know, as far back as human beings have inhabited a place. So how best can we do this? Well, one way we can do it is to engage with human narratives at different levels. Uh, and, and I'll talk about the particular level we were at now uh, with the next slide. So as a place-based educator, I was always very interested in how literary narratives about the Southwest um, informed not only how people understand the Southwest in all different ways, but how they related to the geoscientific understanding of these places. And so I, I was a very avid reader of, of many Southwestern authors, but hardly an expert and, and really wanted to become better versed in this. So I. I, I want to acknowledge uh, my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Joni Adamson at, at ASU. And I, I sort of engaged with her this idea that we would create a place-based seminar course that was joint English and geology that we co-taught together. Now, Joni is a professor of English. She's a distinguished professor at ASU. She's also a pioneer in, the, in a field that's referred to as the environmental humanities, how humanities interpret the, in the environment and how, how uh, writings and humanistic uh, contributions can help us to, uh, to better sustain environmental and, and cultural systems in the future. So we developed a course that blended humanities and geoscience by analyzing how 
uh, samples of, of literary writers and earth scientists who write um, have different but complementary means of, of reading landscapes and interpreting those landscapes. And so it was a seminar course in which we tasked our students with reading a lot of, a lot of readings, uh, weekly discussions, written analyses in the forms of essays um, uh, about these writings. And we, we, we looked at novelists, poets, nature writers, educators, earth scientists, many of these writers indigenous. Uh, focused on on storied places in the Southwest, and because of the funding from the uh, the Desert Humanities Initiative, we were also able to invite several of the writers themselves who we studied to uh, to speak to the students and other Southwestern scholars who added depth and context. So the idea here is that we're engaging with literary narratives about the Southwest, whether they are poetry, uh, fiction, nonfiction, scientific writing together to see how, how all of these different narratives interpret and make sense of the Southwest. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, we taught this this past spring uh, because of COVID. It was a completely online course, except we were able to actually have two very enjoyable socially distanced field trips to a couple of places in the area around Phoenix. And we were able to get out and, and engage with some of these landscapes. So we organized this course as a circular journey from the Colorado Plateau. This is a, this is a, a map of the, um, uh, a relief, a shaded relief map of, the, of southwestern North America, and you can see the primary um, topographic divisions or physiographic provinces, if you will. Um, Phoenix is located down in the low elevation, low relief basin and range. Um, the Navajo Nation and, and, and Hopi Nation and other areas around there are on the Colorado Plateau, which is high and relatively low relief and sits on a big stack of rocks. And then to the east, you have the Rio Grande Rift. You have a, an active continental crustal rift valley that's opening up, um, that's spreading and, and forming this, this long chain of basins. And so we started on the Colorado Plateau geographically and we migrated in a, in a sunwise circular direction into the Rio Grande Rift and then down to the Basin and Range in the choice of writers. On the right, you see the complete list of writers that we use. We did not, some of these writers, we looked at whole works and some of them we used excerpts and the names that were in italics are the people who actually got to speak to the students. So you know, I would consider this to be, although it's not complete, it's a pretty, pretty good list of, of some of the you know, most distinguished Southwestern writers who are out there, uh, Southwestern artists, uh, if you will. And uh, what I'm gonna do now, since you know, I've only got a few more minutes, is I'm gonna single out four of the many writers that we, that we studied and, and sort of illustrate what ideas they share, what ideas they presented us in their writing and, and, and how we interpreted them and also maybe a choice quotation from their work. So if I can have the next slide, please. The first writer I'm going to talk about is Laura Tohi. Okay, Laura Tohi is Diné. She's Navajo from the Navajo Nation. She is a professor of English at, at Arizona State, but she's also distinguished as the poet laureate of the Navajo Nation. And uh, she wrote a wonderful book of poetry in 2005 um, that was illustrated with photographs by Stephen Strom called Say Yes. So she was talking about Canyon de Chez, which is where she came from, deep in the rock. And uh, some of the themes in that writing we've, we've uh, illustrated here that, that Say Yes is a, is a heartland of the Diné Nation. It's a place that Diné have, have deemed as incredibly important and very, very close to the, to the heart of their entire uh, land, their entire homeland base, but also historically it has been a place of depredations by invaders over and over again from, from times of the Spanish and the Mexicans to the Americans. Uh, it was a, it was a, a site of many, many uh, tragic and bloody conflicts. Um, uh, the last one being the uh, which was the long walk in which uh, Diné people were forcibly a, uh, displaced from here to a concentration camp in New Mexico for many, many years. Um, she talks about, in a sort of an earth science way, colors of rocks, iron and sandstone and iron in the blood, um, how stories are embedded in landscapes and, and gives wonderfully vivid illustrations of how Diné people go about their everyday lives right down there in this, in this magnificent canyon. I mean, people, people come from all around the world to view this beautiful landscape, but it's, it's home to people and people live out their, their, their daily lives in the same place. So the quote I picked for her, um, you could read it here yourself if you'd like. Um, what made this earth red, these rocks red? Was it the light from earth and sky to remind us at day's end of the color of our births? Is it all the trails we took upon ourselves or that were forced upon us? beginning with our blood trails to Huelde and back? 
our fragile lives, tentative, brave, wavering through all the worlds you traveled. So this, this quote, I think you know, it encapsulates the geology and encapsulates the beauty of the landscape and encapsulates the tragedies that have been imposed on this landscape by, by depredations over the years. And, and Laura was one of our guest speakers and really was a wonderfully engaging speaker. Uh, next slide, please. The next speaker probably many of, are familiar with. He's been, he's been greatly lauded. He's certainly very well known. Ed Abbey um, died many years ago, but his works uh, live on as a, as a Southwestern writer. And, and the students read Desert Solitaire, one of his sort of classic works from 1971, which uh, summarized his experiences as a ranger in Arches National Park, back when Arches was still a pretty undeveloped place in the 1960s. Um, one of the most richly evocative writers when it comes, turn, uh, comes to describing natural landscapes and the features of natural landscapes and remarkably prescient in his warnings about what he called industrial tourism and depletion of the Colorado River. And right now we're seeing this. Not only are we seeing in the face of climate change driven drought, a, a great depletion of the, of the lifeblood of the Southwest, the Colorado River, but also if you follow the news, you've heard that, that Arches National Park is basically being overrun by tourists now. They actually have to close it down uh, parts of the day almost every day because of the, the tremendous demand. Um, and I, I picked a couple of quotes there. I'm not going to read them because of time, but you can, you can have a look at these. They kind of illustrate some of these points. But engaging with Ed Abbey, we cannot avoid the fact that if you look at his writing, he also was quite bigoted. There was a lot of his writing that was bigoted, was ethnocentric, was sexist. Uh, even to the point of being racist. And we can't, we can't dance around those facts. He's, uh, his writing is, is beautiful and magnificent, but it is not without flaws. And that we, we paid a lot of attention to that and we discussed that. And while we could not get Abby himself to speak, uh, one of our colleagues, Professor Paul Hurt at ASU actually knew Abby. And so he came and, and kind of gave us a, a, a narrative of what, what Abby was like. And he did not shy away from the, uh, from the, the flaws in Abby's, uh, in Abby's life and Abby's work as well. Next slide, please. Leslie Marmon Silco, certainly one of my, one of my favorite authors. She's a, a indigenous from Laguna Pueblo, the Kawaii people. Uh, she's written many uh, spectacular books. She was one of the very first MacArthur Foundation Fellows and has been recognized as a leader in the uh, what's called the Native American Renaissance, the, uh, the uh, advent of, of literary works by and about Native Americans, not, but not books about Native Americans written by non-Indigenous people. And Yellow Woman and the Beauty of the Spirit is a magnificent collection of essays that deal with uh, themes like the uh, familial concentrations of Indigenous people, the homelands, um, humans being an inseparable part of landscape. Um, that's the quotation at the bottom talking about that. Um, some very, very trenchant commentary on US federal policies toward indigenous people. And uh, since she lived in, in her, her homeland, her Laguna Pueblo homeland was in an area that was greatly affected by uranium mining during the Cold War and the environmental and health uh, effects that followed. Um, he wrote, she wrote a great deal about uh, uranium mining in the Southwest and its impact on indigenous people. And that first quote, that a rock has being or spirit, although we may not understand it, the spirit may differ from the spirit we know in animals or plants or ourselves. Um, but in the end, we all originate from the depths of the earth. That's a quote that I have used in every single geology course I've taught since I first became uh, acquainted with, with uh, Leslie Marmon Silco's work. I think it's a, it's a magnificent quote and it gets my students thinking about, you know, even those who are from different cultural worldviews, uh, thinking about a diverse cultural ways of interpreting geology, interpreting something as fundamental as what a rock is and what a rock represents. Um, so again, I, I, we are very, uh, Leslie Marmon Silco's work is, is remarkably rich and, uh, and I, I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to, to you know, integrate indigenous ideas uh, with, with their teaching. Uh, look, look to her writings. Um, the next slide, please. And the final author I'm going to talk about is Ana Castillo. Ana Castillo is Chicana. Um, she comes from a, a New Mexico cultural tradition, although she was originally from Chicago. Uh, but she wrote an amazing novel that, that, that I think people all should read. I hadn't read it until I, Joni brought it to my attention for this class, So Far From God. So Far From God is a, 
is a novel that's very difficult to describe because it's been described as not really adhering to any particular genre. It is truly multi-generic. It, it is a narrative. It is um, magical realism in, in the tradition of many other Latin writers. It evokes magical realism. It uh, again makes tremendous commentary about social, political and environmental justice issues. Um, the Catholic religion and its relationship to indigenous cultures, um, spirituality, gender, and feminism. And, and again, one of the main interests we had was that it's, it's very biting commentary through the experiences of the characters in the novel on environmental justice issues related to the Rio Grande Valley in central New Mexico. And the fact that you know, the, the uh, industries that came there and polluted the, the groundwater and took advantage of um, a, a low-income families to, uh, to hire them to do dangerous and, and ultimately fatal work you know, in some of these industries. And one of the characters in the novel epitomizes that. So this wonderful quote here from, from Castillo, um, Sophia's dry and thirsty land by its very nature was a land of indeed ingenious undertakings. And while its early Spanish transplants learned irrigation methods from the indigenous residents to sustain crops and graze animals, how to make do with raw materials, talk with the sky and honor mountains and streams. And despite all of their relentless faith together, the sheer daily toil, the centuries going by, the world changing around them, it never got no easier. I mean, I think that that epitomizes that novel in one paragraph, and that, that's really what that novel is all about. Uh, and we did not have uh, uh, Ms. Castillo come to speak, but we did have um, a, an expert on her writing and on the writing of many other Chicana writers, um, Professor Priscilla Ibarra at the University of North Texas. She, she spoke for us. So these are just four of the many authors that we engaged with in this course. And uh, we did uh, do a, an anonymous survey after the course, and we found in general that the students uh, about half of whom were geology majors, about half of whom were um, English majors. They were very culturally representative of our university. So we had a number of, of, of people from different cultural and, and ethnic backgrounds. It was a very diverse class. Um, they found it very good. This is the first time we did it. It was very experimental, but uh, they reported back that they were glad to have taken the class and they found it incredibly edifying. And it was a great experience for me to learn so much about these, these writings. And I, I feel much better versed in, in these literary works and, and able to share these works and these words with, with students in the future. So I think that's it for me. So I will say thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And at this point, uh, Sierra, I will give you control and hand things over to you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was a great intro into what I wanted to talk about as well. And the, those landscapes, those landscapes that we all can look out our windows now and see, whether it's in a city, whether we're rural, whether in my neck of the woods right now, we have wildfires right on the riverbanks. And many of these stories are, are, are things that we can still see today. And so our living ancestral knowledge, it's not only embedded in our language and our cultural values, but the landscapes themselves that we call our homelands. And so by sharing our indigenous stories, our traditional stories that happened long before people um, even came to this earth, and considering that modern Western science or these literary works, we can continue to gain um, a much deeper understanding of, of the, the lands that we all study as geoscientists, as ecologists, as whichever ologists you may be. And we all can gain a deeper understanding through um, bringing in these various knowledge systems. And I wanted to uh, not miss the opportunity to share some of the Nimiku literature. Nimiku is again, what we call ourselves the people, but we're Nez Perce, um, which is our, our colonial name. And there's, there's just a couple of books that I wanted to throw up here. I'm big on collecting all of our Nimiku literature so I can read what has been written by our own people. And, and a lot of times for our own people and to benefit those who are outside our community. Salmon and his people talks about fish and fishing in this first culture. It has traditional stories in it. It talks about um, the science behind our fisheries management, all the different fish species and what kind of habitats they live in. But it also talks about those personal stories, those lived experiences. Many of our elders who are no longer here are quoted in that book, sharing their experience on 
on specific places, Celilo Falls, the Salmon River, the Snake River, the Clearwater, the Columbia. Their own personal stories of these places are also in that book. And it's a really great resource for, um, again, our own community, our, our current generations, but the future generations to come. And I'm, I'm really interested in extending that into another volume of literature that, that captures the stories of now who are, our, who are our elders, who are young young men and women at the time of this publishing. Yellow Wolf is a story of, it's called Yellow Wolf, his own story. L.B. McWhorter um, sat down with Yellow Wolf after the Nest Purse retreat from the U.S. government and wrote about his experience through that. And it talks about the landscapes, the, the various ecosystems that they traveled through, the landmarks that are geological features along the way, the women, men, and children who traveled that route. And, and it's a really touching story. It's really hard to read as we continue to commemorate those places where battles were, were taken and, and had. Lewis and Clark Among the Nest Purse was a really great book uh, written, I believe, in the 2000s um, and released. It tells, you know, we have people come from all over the world to learn about Lewis and Clark and the Nest Purse. And some of our elders realize, you know, nobody, Mimi Poo is telling that story. It's a lot of outsiders telling that story. So they sat down together and wrote this extravagant book detailing our own recounts of that time when, when Lewis and Clark came stumbling over the Bitterroot Mountains. And this last book, I Am of This Land, is a book that's primarily focused on wildlife at the Hanford site. Hanford Nuclear Waste Site is included in our traditional uh, territories, our homelands. And again, it has traditional stories. It has accounts from, from people in our community, but also talks about the science and restoration of the, of the place that we can no longer visit, that has our sacred mountains on it, that has sacred locations where our salmon swim past. And so I share all of these examples of, because um, a lot of times I get asked, where can I, where do I start with this? Well, there is literature out there written by indigenous people. And I encourage you to seek that out for whichever area you may be in. Of course, I'm biased. I want everyone to read about the Nimi Poo, but um, I encourage you to seek out literature in your own area written by the indigenous people there. But today I also wanted to share some stories of our homelands. I talked about briefly, you know, the geological features across our landscape. And this story, you can see Ant in the yellow jacket they're battling there. Well, the story goes that they were arguing over a piece of salmon. There was plenty of salmon going up and down the river. So there was no need to argue over this piece. The story goes on, you know, it can be a 15 minute to two day story as, as much as detail as you wanna get into it. But I just wanted to give this brief uh, summary of so you can get the understanding of what was going on. They were arguing over a piece of salmon. It's yeah, yeah. coyote came and told them to stop, they did not, and so he turned them to stone. They still sit along the Clearwater River today. You can see them on the hillside there, just at the junction of Highway 95 and Highway 12. These landscapes are living, right? They are still here. We can still see that story being acted out today. Coyote left them there to remind us and all the other animals, you know, to not be greedy, to share, to make sure that everybody is, is, is taken care of. There's so many lessons that go into all the stories that are still present on our landscapes. And we call them living stories because it's still relevant today. We still have to remind people to share. We still have to remind people to not be greedy, to not be stingy, to take care of one another. And whenever, um, especially siblings in our community are kind of battling like that, we take them to that place and remind them of that story and have them sit there you know, for a while until they can come to that understanding of that place, of that story, and be able to look at their sibling and, and have respect again and understand that importance of sharing. Not, not with fear that they may be turned to stone, but because they understand that deeper meaning that's associated with that story. This story here, you can see it's the Yaya, Coyote, and Tuxpo, Beaver. And this is on the Snake River. If you're familiar with Hell's Canyon, we're at the gate of Hell's Canyon right here. And I could look out my window and see the river, but I can't see these geologists we know are calling them basalt columns, right? But the story is much different from our perspective. Again, these stories happened a long time ago. 
And you might hear once upon a time or uh, a long time ago. But the way we start our stories is Wakipa. And the longer time ago it was, the longer you say it. So Wakipa. This story happened a long time ago. And what had happened at this location was Beaver was building a dam as beavers do, but across the Snake River, which has substantial size at this point, he was building this dam and it's Yaya Coyote who, who's intelligent, but sometimes he's, a, he's, a, he's kind of that guy that always tries to do too much. And sometimes it doesn't work out and sometimes it does. And it's, he's just that guy, he, you know, whenever we say that guy, he's that guy. And Beaver Tuxpole was building this dam across the river. It's Yaya came and said, Tuxpole, you can't block the whole river from everyone. The salmon need to get by. The lamprey need to get by. Because there's others upriver that depend upon them to come visit. Tuxpole, in his manner that he is, he said, oh, it's Yaya, you don't know, just don't bother me. So he continued to build this dam bigger and bigger, blocking the whole Snake River. The Snake River, if you don't know, is a it comes from the goes into the Columbia River, but before that, it goes all the way into the state of Wyoming, Wyoming into Idaho, Idaho into Washington, and then into the Columbia River and out to the ocean. So this is a pretty extensive river, and this right here at this point, we're just starting to enter into Washington. We're actually at the border. The river is the border between Idaho and Washington. So Tuxpole is blocking tremendous amounts of miles of river by building this dam. In his greed and in his mentality, you know, they're really hard workers, which is a great quality to have. But sometimes, you know, you need to consider others in your hard work. Is there balance? Are you, are you disrupting that balance by doing the work that you're doing? You have to take a step back and see the bigger picture. What Tuxpole was doing was blocking this whole river. It's Yaya came back and said, Tuxpole, I told you to not build this dam. You're being selfish and stingy and on and on. Like I said, these stories can go on for days. So eventually they begin to tussle and wrestle and bang across the canyon walls, rolling from one side to the other. As you saw with uh, Ant and the Yellow Jacket, the animals were much bigger at the time of these stories. Well, as Tuxpole was being defeated and trying to escape its Iaya, you can see his claw marks on the sides of the canyon walls. And that's what we see here. We see these marks here still today to remind us, are we supposed to be greedy and build up the, the dam and block all the transport for everyone else? No, we're not supposed to do that. These are still things that we see today that we're challenged with, the dams that are blocking the return of our salmon. Yes, there's a lot of questions about, well, how are we gonna provide energy for the Northwest without dams? Well, let's figure it out. Let's find those solutions to those, to those problems, but let's not repeat ancient old problems that are still um, uh, prevalent on our, on, our, on our homelands, on our landscape. We know what happens when we do that. That's not the way we're to be. Those stories are still there. This is a living landscape that carries on these lessons that if we so choose to listen, may make life easier, not just for us humans, but for all of the plant and animal relatives associated to the lands upon which we live. Possible beaver, he's in another story. And this one I'm going to read because I could tell, I really like this story and I could tell it, um, you know, I really could get into all the details and act out all the characters, but to, to refrain and save you all from my, um, my childlike demeanor, which is entertaining. Um, many youth do like it and elders as well. But to keep it on time, I'll read the story here. This landscape here pictured is the Grand Ronde, the Grand Ronde River, which comes from Oregon into the Snake River. Once before, or since this is written in English, Wakiba. Once before there were many people in the world, the different animals and trees lived and moved about and talk together just like human beings. At this time, the pine trees had the secret of fire and guarded it jealously from the rest of the world so that no matter how cold it was, nobody could get any fire to warm himself unless he was a pine. At length, an unusually cold season came and all the animals were in danger of freezing to death because they could get no fire. 
but all plans to find out their secret from the pines were in vain until Beaver hit upon one which proved successful. At a certain place on the Grand Ronde River in Idaho, the pines were about to hold a great council. They had built a large fire to warm themselves. After coming out of the icy water from bathing and had posted the guards round about to keep off all the animals and other intruders who might steal their secret fire. But Beaver, Tuskful, had hidden under the bank near the fire before the guards had been posted. And so he escaped their notice. After a while, a live coal rolled down the bank close to Beaver, which he seized and hid in his breast. And then he ran as fast as he could. The pines immediately raised hue and cry and chased after him. Whenever he was hard pressed, Beaver darted from side to side and dodged his pursuers. And when he had a good start, he kept straight course. Hence the Grand Ronde River is very torturous in some parts of its course and straight for some distance in others because it uh, preserves the direction Beaver took in his flight. After running a long time, the pines grew tired and decided to abandon the chase. So most of them halted in a body on the riverbanks where they remain in great numbers still to this day and form a growth so dense that hunters can hardly get through it. I've been there, I've tried to hunt. It's very difficult to see. A few, however, kept on after beaver, but they finally gave out one after another and they remained scattered at intervals along the banks of the rivers in the places where they stopped. There was one cedar running with the foremost pines and although he despaired of capturing beaver, he said, it, he said to the few pines still in chase, although we cannot catch beaver, I will keep on top of the hill yonder and see how far ahead he is. So he ran to the top of the hill and saw beaver far ahead, just diving into the big snake river where the Grand Ronde enters it. So that further pursuit was out of the question. He saw beaver dart across the big snake river and give fire to some willows on the opposite bank and recross farther on and give fire to the birches and so on to all different kinds of trees. Since then, all who have wanted fire have got it from those particular woods because they have fire in them and they give it up more readily than other kinds when rubbed together in their ancient way. Cedar still stands all alone on the very top of the hill where he stopped in the chase after beaver. Near the junction of the Grand Ron and Big Snake Rivers, he is very old, so old that the top is dead, but he still stands as proof to the truth of this story, that the chase was a very long one, and it's shown where there's no cedars for hundreds of miles upstream from where he stands. The old pe people point out to him and share with the children when they pass by and say, see, there is old cedar standing there in the very spot where he stopped chasing beaver. So that story has so many ecological uh, aspects in it. It has zoology, where does beaver hide? Under the banks. Uh, it talks about different species of plants and trees that carry fire. It has, um, talks about the geography of the Grand Ron River. It talks about the ecology and where the trees grow and why. And it has, aspects of that technology. How do we get fire by rubbing it together in that ancient way with only the, the specific trees that have that quality? And then there's always that cultural component, those values that are embedded in the stories. Just like Tuxkull on the Snake River trying to block the dam. There are various story, um, values that are embedded in this story. And I don't like to point them out. I, it's, it's always a learning aspect. You might hear this story, and I've heard this story probably hundreds of times. But in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, maybe when I'm an elder, I'll hear it again, and I'll find new values in there. Stories are very much like that. We call them living. It's not only our stories that are living, but these landscapes that are embedded in, this, in these stories. They're living because they continue to teach us day after day. Doesn't matter which season you are in life, which season you are in the year, summertime. Right now there's wildfire season. What can we learn about that? In the wintertime when the story takes place, what can we learn about that? 
But I'd like to share this story because not too long ago, our very own EOS magazine featured a story and the title was, Are Beavers Nature's Little Firefighters? And of course that caught my eye and I thought, what? The, the greater science community knows our story of beaver and fire? Not quite, but what the article did highlight, and you can read the, the small um, caption here, it says, it's about damn time. Beavers are acknowledged for their firefighting skills in five recent blazes. And I believe the story took place um, in California, the study, looking at areas where there were wildfires. And you can see in the image here, the areas where beaver had built dams, the riparian area was spared when wildfires came through. You can see on the adjacent little un undammed creek where it was scorched and it looks like there's no water in, in, that, in that creek anymore. So I tell this and I point this out because these stories share so much more depth than, than what we can understand. Beaver didn't just take the fire and spread it. No, Beaver still to this day maintains that balance. He maintains that responsibility of taking care of fire, taking care of places where there's fire. We can all imagine that there's probably some willows right there along that bank that he gave fire to, but he continues to take care of those things. And it's all circular, it's all holistic, it's all in balance in one way or another. And there's countless examples of this, not only in our Mimikou, traditional stories and our living landscapes, but all across the globe. The indigenous communities have stories that have taken place thousands of years ago. And as, as we continue to develop our Western knowledge, our modern science, if we continue to look back and pair these together, what, what great value we can get in understanding the places that we come from, the places that we occupy, the places that we study, visit, enjoy, and this, this is just, again, one example. And I like to share this one, especially with AGU, because this, this, came, this story came from an AGU publication. And I just encourage you all to continue to look out at the landscape. Maybe you see a bird. It's not by a mistake that you're seeing that bird. Take a moment and ask, why am I seeing that bird? Why am I seeing that tree? Why did I notice that spider that was crawling down the wall in my house? All of these things have, have reasons, stories, and the places that we study are filled with this knowledge and values. And the more we can, again, weave these two knowledge bases together, the more we can understand a holistic um, depth of what it is that we're experiencing in our lives. Our landscapes are living. Our stories help portray those reasons, those lessons, and those values. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share this today because this is, this is what I get to share as faculty at a tribal college. These are the things that we, we really um, uplift our students in understanding, elevating their knowledge, not only in ecological or geological aspects, but their cultural identity as well. And that is beneficial for all students, whether indigenous or not, to understand these different facets of life that we live. That's the aisle. Thank you so much, Sierra. Um, I'm just doing something quick on my end. All right. So um, some questions have come in. If you have any more questions, please put them in that Q&A box. Uh, so while those come in, just shortly before we get into that, um, I'm going to ask you all one more question. Um, and if you weren't here in the beginning, it's the same question. But now that you've been with us for the past 40 say minutes, uh, how likely are you now to use literary works in your communication, your education, frankly, science or otherwise? Um, and just while people are answering, uh, Steve's been kind enough to answer some questions in the chat and uh, anything like this, this recording will be available. We'll follow up with all of you. And any of the literary works that have been mentioned uh, will provide uh, uh, a list of, of some of those things as well um, so that you all can easily access them. So I'll give this about 10 more seconds, let's say.
All right, let's see. All right, that's great. Uh, I've really seen that kind of shift towards that increase in confidence. And again, this is just kind of the the um, beginning here. We we appreciate uh, Stephen Sierra spending the time with us today. But kind of in a broader uh, storytelling context, just a few. Um, let's say clerical things. Like I said in the beginning, this is part of a larger storytelling series we at Sharing Science are doing um, around basics and skills and all sorts of different things. And so um, please uh, consider uh, either visiting um, the recordings we have, which we'll pass along in the end, or the, the couple more that we have after this. If you're interested in science communication, just more broadly, uh, consider becoming part of the sharing science community. It's a community of folks who are interested in and passionate about this stuff. We have lots of resources. We have science communication manuscripts and toolkits and guides and discussion and all sorts of different resources. Um, I'm actually gonna stop on this one and just leave this one here. So our guests are on various um, uh, social media platforms and then there's all this uh, stuff as well through the AGU folks. Uh, so I'll leave this up for a second just for folks to grab onto. But in the meantime, we're going to get to some questions. And I'm actually going to, this could be for, for frankly, either or, or both of you. But uh, someone asked, can you provide tips or etiquette for educators who are not from a place who would like to share local stories in kind of these culturally appropriate ways with the, um, with the, like the side note of that they've learned that some stories of living landscapes are allowed to be told only by certain people or at certain times of seasons or whatever it might be. So maybe just from either or both of you, some suggestions on how to handle that. I guess I'll just say that for our readings, when we wanted to, to integrate indigenous knowledge, we made sure that these were works that, that were written by indigenous authors. Um, this was information that they wanted to share. This is information that they provided. Um, when I was working at Diné College, we had uh, Diné cultural advisors um, who could advise us on what was appropriate. And it's correct that there is knowledge that can only be shared by certain people at certain times. And, and uh, I would just say, and Ciara can maybe have more commentary on this. My, my comment would be just try to find the cultural experts in your community. Try, you know, if there's a um, cultural preservation office from a local indigenous nation or something like that, try to try to locate them and and come with a you know with a spirit of of respect and understanding and say you know we we would we would like to use this material if it's appropriate and and in ways that's appropriate and and uh, I think people would be very willing to to help you with that. Yeah, and I'll just add, even as, as a member of my own community, a citizen of the Nez Perce tribe, being a Nimi Pu'aya, a Nez Perce woman, there's things, um, you know, in sharing this story. I'm not going to share stories that haven't been already published or shared with the public. Um, that's a big responsibility, and it goes through a lot of different processes and protocols with our own tribal cultural research, resources, what can and can't be shared. And so a big thing that I do, and that's why I shared these books at the beginning, was capitalize on what has already been out there, what has already been shared with the broader community. And to me, that's, that's um, you know, something that's pushing me to want to write some more books for our own community, for our own people, about our own landscapes from our own perspective. Because there's, there's not enough out there, but I want to make sure that it's done appropriately and correctly. And, you know, maybe in 20 years, somebody in their 30s, just like me, will be uh, wanting to write some more or share some more. And if I can have that published for them to do that, um, to share our stories, that would just be so valuable. And I'm looking forward to hopefully inspiring others in our community to write our stories so it's accessible and appropriate. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna stop the share so folks can just see the two of you. Uh, Sierra, this one's aimed to you. Uh, so it seems that stories, that these stories require time to digest. And in these days of this kind of short attention spans, uh, how do you get people to take that time uh, to potentially properly digest them? Yeah, and I, and I saw one of the other comments um, alluding to the importance of sharing these stories with youth. And youth, adults, elders, like I said, all, all will take 
from the stories what they're supposed to. That's the beauty of our stories is there's never one lesson. There's multiple lessons for multiple people at multiple times and seasons. And honestly, I've, I've done multiple um, outreach and education events. And once I start telling a story in the animated way that I really like to, and then have an activity for youth for them to draw, draw what it is that you see. Comic books are really big with our two boys and they love to draw it's Iaia and, and his stories and adventures, throwing our own dog in the mix as well. So they make it creative. They make it relevant to themselves. They may draw in things that are not in the stories from a long time ago, like cars and, and houses, but they're understanding. And you know, by, by telling the stories, not just one time, but over and over and over, they begin to make more sense or different sense. And that's that's all our stories are, is they're living as well. So that, that's the best advice I can give is just continue to tell the stories and, and let them evolve in the way that they're supposed to. Great. Um, Steve, I'm gonna aim this one to you, but either of you could, could answer this. But as someone who is doing a style of teaching, has taught this course and I know it's new, um, is, Anyone else at either in your department, or your program doing this type of work? Are you seeing this type of uh, kind of dual course catch on? Do you have kind of institutional support for it? Just kind of wondering about the mechanics of doing this type of work at a university. Yeah, one of the one of the really nice things about ASU is that we do have a very a strong tradition of interdisciplinary and and uh, uh, cross cultural. Uh, collaboration. And so this Desert Humanities Initiative that was developed is, is specifically to um, engage with, with desert landscapes from a humanistic perspective. And so they are supporting a, a lot of similar initiatives. I, our course, I think, is the first of its kind in, in our own academic units. But uh, I'd have to say geographers, this is the kind of thing that many geographers have done in various ways for, for a long time. And, and uh, we have a very active Indigenous Studies uh, program at ASU. And I think that that certainly there's a there's a tremendous uh, wealth of, of magnificent uh, courses and programs in indigenous law, literature and and in southwestern literature that that has been um, has been taught here over the years. I, I think ours is the first that kind of brought it together with geology, though, in a whole course. I mean, I have colleagues that certainly use quotations and use works and writings um, uh, in their uh, in their teaching. Great. Um... For, for both of you, uh, do either of you um, compare, I mean, I figure out how to word this, compare stories to other places in addition to kind of your local places. So how important is it that stories refer to local places versus stories of elsewhere? Our course was specifically directed toward what we refer to as the, the Southwest, the Southwestern North America. So we did not, um, we did not go beyond that, but uh, you know, you could do a certainly do a comparative place-based literature course. I think um, we did not, but uh, we had plenty to work with right at home. Yeah, I appreciate that question because you know we do have limited to work with, even though we're we're right here in our own homelands and our own own place that is filled with stories. But to have literary works, um, especially that are fiction, is is very limited, and so. Something that we, in, in my ecology course, particularly, I pair it with braiding sweetgrass. And then I challenge our students to go out to our homelands, look at our homelands and their landscape and the ecology concepts we covered for the week, and write a couple paragraphs similar to Robin Wall Kimmer and how she writes braiding sweetgrass, but about our own homelands and our own landscape. So I'm big on, we don't have it, so you guys are the scholars, let's do it. You can do it. And, and they do, and it's beautifully written. That's great. Um, there's a, a question, mm -hmm. how can, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm laughing because I know, I know this questioner very well. Uh, hi, Cam. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and uh, sorry, the, yeah, the question is how can geoscientists highlight the stories among the landscapes? Well, I think, you know, also Cam actually knows the answer to that question as well as I do, but, uh, but um, you know, it, it, I think it, the most important thing, I always, I always tell people, uh, I've been a long, a long, a long time advocate of um, 
of place-based education. And people say, well, how do you do place-based education in, you know, fill in the blank place? And uh, the response I always have is you have to have an, an endless love for that place and an endless curiosity where you're always trying to learn more that's appropriate to learn about that place. And I think when you, when you start to listen to the stories, you listen to people, you, you accrue this understanding and then you want to find ways to share that with your, with your students or with the public if you do public outreach. So um, learn as much as you can in respect and humility and then, and then think of ways that you can share it appropriately. And I'll just say real quick, learn from the landscape go be with it go sit there's so many lessons that'll come come to you you don't have to seek them out you just go to the place and you will be filled yes absolutely yeah that's really great um i have a question for well frankly for either of you but um for those who don't tell stories, just stories in general, frankly, as part of their communication or education efforts, but really want to. They want to incorporate more of this like narrative structure, or whatever it might be, into their education and communication. Any suggestions on, I guess, where to start, whether that's resources or just confidence or whatever it might be? Oh well, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly respond. One thing that I, I encourage our students, and sometimes it's our, um, in elementary school, they might call it a bell ringer or a starter activity, is to have them Google a place on our homelands and say wildfires. And, and just see what comes up, see what stories, it may be articles, it may be advertisements, whatever it may be, you know, that's a good starting point to, to see what's out there about these topics. And, and from there, we can really start to dig into whichever whichever class we're exploring that day but that that's that's we've got the world at our fingertips they say yeah that's uh it's a good reminder that the answer to um a lot of the questions we might have or or barriers we used to have to overcome really aren't there anymore um which is a really great place probably to end on, frankly. Uh, we've, we've gone through our questions and we're running up against time. But I want to thank both of you again for being with us today. Uh, this is this is this has been a fantastic thing, frankly, for me to listen to, I'll, I'll say selfishly. Uh, and um, just a reminder for everyone, we'll be following up with all of you with additional resources and everything else. So um, if there's anything that you went, oh crap, I wish I'd have known, it's probably coming your way. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Sierra and Steve, and um, we'll hopefully see you all at another webinar.